as we come back to this stanza in Psalm 119, uh, we've seen the psalmist declare his love for God's law and even tell us the fruit of what comes from loving God's law, which is meditating on it. Through that meditation, he received wisdom and understanding. Wisdom that he said made him wiser than his enemies and gave him greater understanding than even his worldly-minded teachers and the aged. And we talked last time about wisdom, wisdom being knowledge applied. It's, it's the ability to see life from God's perspective and then act accordingly. Wisdom is ultimately displayed in a holy, obedient life submitted to the Lordship of Christ and to the Word of God that teaches us and shows us how to live the right way. Now, the, the psalmist here is going to tell us how the Word of God helps us do that. Because the Bible not only gives us wisdom, but it works in our hearts, giving us a love for the ways of God. So the Bible is not only a, a book of instruction, but it's a living word that creates in us faith, hope, and love. It causes us to love God and His ways and to hate and shun the ways of evil. So listen to what Psalm 119 says. We're going to read uh, verses 101 through 104. It says, I have refrained my feet from every evil way, that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. So I want us to see first in this, God's word helps us walk the right way. It helps us walk the right way. We, we see the psalmist practice here, right? He has refrained his feet from every evil way. He says, I hold back my feet. I have restrained my feet. The way we live uh, is indicative of what we believe. There's a lot in the Bible uh, relating to walk. Uh, the Christian life is considered a, a walk. And Spurgeon says that that walk is ultimately um, dictated by our affections. Which, how we live, ultimately follows what we believe and the desires of our heart. And this verse, as I meditated on it this week, is, is radical. Think about what this verse is saying here, verse 100. I understand, uh, sorry, I, verse 101, I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep your word. Think about what this is telling us. The psalmist here is at war with evil. He, he's not just fighting the big sin that's obvious or the sin that robs him of his peace and joy, but every evil way, all things that offend God. He wants his whole being to be in line with God's word. And think about this and compare this to Psalm 1, uh, to Psalm 1 which we looked at before. But compare this to Psalm 1 where it says, in verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now, while we may actually walk with sinners and stand with them and sit with them in, in literal life, uh, like when we go to a restaurant or something like that, this is obviously a spiritual metaphor uh, for how we live. But what I want you to notice is the progression here in Psalm 1-1, or the regression, if you want to call it that. There is, there is a progressive nature of sin, a slow fade, if you will. And it's what is being prevented in Psalm 1, 119, 101, where he says, I, I have restrained my feet from every evil way. I am actively battling my own feet from walking to sin. As we know, we have a battle with our own flesh. We're at war with our feet. We must keep them under us in control. But notice in Psalm 1, 1, sin's progression. First, the man walks in the counsel of the ungodly. He listens to their advice, he tries it, he compromises on his convictions. Then, he gets complacent. He stands around in the way of sinners. He's standing around with them, he's taking their advice, and now he's no longer moving. He's, he's lingering in sin. No longer walking in the narrow way, now he's standing between the two, straddling the fence. He's, he's lukewarm, if you will. And then if left there long enough, eventually he'll take a seat. And he's going to sit down and he's going to become a scoffer. He's going to mock those 
who are of the way of godliness. And he's actually going to try to lure people away from godliness to bring them to sit down with him. You start hanging around people who are loose about God and have very little conviction, and you're going to be with them. Eventually, you'll be sitting with them, openly disobeying God and mocking those who do obey. It starts by listening to wrong counsel, finding answers from other sources besides the Bible. This leads to wrong thinking. This leads to standing idle in sin. We no longer see it as exceedingly sinful. This is why, in Psalm 119.101, he is actively restraining his feet from every evil way. Even the seemingly small counsel that does not seem like it's that important in the larger scheme of things makes our heart start to grow hard. And we begin engaging in sinful behavior. And then we take a seat. And we start living our life in that manner. We begin to adopt the attitude of the world and those around us. This is really similar to what uh, the prophet Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 17, in verse 5 through 8. He says this, he says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusts in man, and makes flesh his arm, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when he good, when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhab uh, and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, that spreads out her roots by the river, and shall not see when the heat comes. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be care careful in the year of the drought, neither shall cease from the yielding fruit. So the question is, where do you get advice? When you have a problem in your marriage, where do you go? When you have a problem with your children or your finances, where do you go? Don't go to the world. Go to the Word. This, this progression comes about in our lives through little compromises that happen as a result of a lack of exposure to the Word of God. At first, we listen to that ungodly counsel, we take advice, and then we become like men who are careless about the things of God, and we forget God. But we need to remember that there is a blessing to the man who doesn't act this way. He doesn't allow himself to digress down that path. In Psalm 119.101, I have refrained my feet from every evil way, is the, 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 the way we do that. He doesn't take that advice. He doesn't take that counsel. He, he listens to God. It's Isaiah 8.19, right? Should not a people seek their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? No. They should listen to the word of God and obey it. It's, it's verse 102, right? I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. He has learned to listen to God, so he walks in God's ways. But here's the question. How does he restrain his feet from evil? By not departing, he tells us. How does he restrain his feet from evil? In verse 102, I have not departed from thy judgments. That's what he means. I have not, I have restrained my feet from evil, therefore I have not departed from your judgments. They are always before me, always in my heart, always on my mind. Next, I want you to see the psalmist's motive here in verse 101. He says, I have refrained my feet from evil. Why? That I may keep, that I might keep thy word. In other parts of Psalm 119, he makes the point that keeping God's word keeps him from evil. But here he flips it. Right? In other parts, it's it's the word of God actively restraining me from sin. But he flips it here. He keeps his feet from from every evil way, he restrains his feet from evil in order to keep God's word. I think one of the reasons he does this is to highlight his motivation to keep God's word. I run from evil because I want to follow God's word. I desire to obey God's word. God's word is still the thing restraining me from evil, but not because I have fear of some fiery judgment, but because I have love for God and his word. Now I strive to obey, not out of legalistic zeal or religious fervor, but because I delight in his law. The believer loves God's word and therefore desires to obey it. We want to remove all hindrances out of the way. We want to abhor that which is evil so that we can cling to that which is good. We have learned to hate even the garment spotted by flesh. We 
fear sin more than we fear leprosy. As we see sinners sinning, we should, we should hear a shout from them in our conscience. Unclean, unclean. And because of this hatred and dread of sin, it causes us to search our hearts to see if there be any wicked way in us. This desire, created in us by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God, through the Gospel, drives us to perfect holiness in the fear of God. And thus the psalmist says, I keep my feet from every evil way, that I might keep thy word. That word that is precious to me, that I love, as he says in verse uh, 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, yea, sweeter than honey. How he says in verse 97, oh, how I love thy law, it is my meditation all the day. We have to remember that we are locked in battle because we, we, we now love God's law and we have a disdain for sin. We're in conflict because the flesh still wants sin. The psalmist has to say, I have to restrain my feet from evil. Though he loves God's law, though it's sweet to his taste, he still has to restrain his feet. Although I am regenerated by the Holy Spirit, my flesh still seems to go after sin. My feet still wander. And so we're locked in this battle, not only with the devil in the world, but with our own flesh. And this is, um, if you look at Romans 7, the Apostle Paul describes this very conflict. In verses 14 and 15, he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that, for what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Paul says he hates the sin that he does. As a believer, we've come to hate our sin. We dread it. But do we still sin? Yes, because we're still in the flesh. As Paul goes on in verse 17, Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Paul says he desires to do good, he desires to obey God. That's the new nature, that's the new heart given to him. But he still struggles with this fleshly conflict. And then he says in verse 21, I find then a law that I would do good, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Paul sees in him a conflict, a war waging. And this is one key aspect of, of spiritual warfare that isn't really talked about. You see, we're not only surrounded by the world, camped in enemy territory, if you will, and have a powerful enemy who's aiming right at us, but we have an enemy within ourselves, our own flesh. With our corrupt flesh, a vigilant devil, and an ensnaring world around us, we cannot lay down our sword for even a moment, or the fight will be lost. George, George Mueller said, The vigor of our spiritual life will be in the exact proportion to how much we value the Bible in our life and thoughts. And that's really the point of Psalm 119. And the, the point of this particular verse, he was restraining his feet from evil in order that he would keep God's judgments. And yet, we still find that we fight against sin. We find ourselves weary and at times even frustrated with ourselves. And when that happens, let us remember the words of Paul at the end of Romans 7. Listen to this in verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. We find that we fail. And when we fail, Christ gives us victory. And one day, He will give us total victory and freedom from this body of sin. But in the meantime, we have the Word of God as our counselor, we have the Spirit of God as our guide. We are warned over and over in the Scriptures to beware of how we walk. To beware of where we step. To watch ourselves. Just think of uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Remember the, the famous verse there where he says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. How? 
looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Notice he doesn't say, just lay aside the sin, but the weight and the sin. You see, there are things that beset us, that hinder us from running the Christian race. Let us instead, instead of being caught up with the treasures and the things of the world, let us look to Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. So the next verse, verse 102, back to Psalm 119, Psalm 119, 102, he says, he says, I have not departed from my judgments, for thou hast taught me. God's word helps us do the right things. It helps us do the right things. We see the psalmist's faithfulness. He says, I have not departed from my judgment. The, the psalmist basically says the other side of what he said in verse 101. In 101, he's refraining his feet from evil, from every evil way, and that is not departing from the judgments of God. If we depart from the judgments of God, we're walking in the way of evil. To not depart from God's judgment is to refrain our feet from evil. That is, he, he has God helping him. He has not departed from God's judgment. Why? For thou hast taught me. We see the psalmist teacher. He has God as his instructor to follow the truth. This is a promise given in the New Covenant. If you remember in Jeremiah 31, um, Jeremiah says, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Jesus said the Spirit would be given uh, and lead us into truth in order to understand God's judgment. The application of His law to our life, we need the Spirit to lead us and enlighten us. If we neglect God's Word, then we'll depart from His judgments. The psalmist is telling us that God's Word has sustaining power in our life. That God's Word is effective in our hearts as a means to sanctify us. It's the, the, the means by which the Spirit uses it's how God strengthens us, increases our faith, increases our hope, and increases our love. Essentially, the psalmist in 119.102 is pointing out how we have God as a teacher in His Word through the Spirit. That by recognizing that and yielding to Him, we do not depart from His judgments because the Spirit's our teacher. But when we neglect the Word in our lives, our faith weakens, our walk is less, and ultimately we backslide. When we hear that word backslide, uh, we sometimes think of someone who uh, falls away from the faith, right? A, a person uh, once seemingly faithful to the Lord, but now has nothing to do with the faith or the church, or who run off and is now living a life of sin and rebellion. But that is not the biblical definition of backslider. That's an apostate, right? That's someone who's abandoned the faith. A backslider is a genuine believer who for a season has less zeal and may battle with some particular besetting sin. It's someone who's grown cold in their walk with the Lord. They lack zeal for the things of God. They lack passion for the person of God. They lack motivation towards the Word of God. They lack depth in their prayers to God. But they always return to the Lord because we persevere, because we're in the hand of Christ, and He says, nothing can pluck you out. The Lord Jesus promised, after all, that He would lose none of His own. A backslider is someone who's drifted in their Christian walk. They're not praying as they should. They're not in the Word like they are, like they, like they were. They're less vigilant in their battle against sin. Their prayers are only about themselves. They have become more concerned with their own comfort than lost souls or the people of God. We've all experienced backsliding in some degree, in one way or another, if we are a follower of the Lord for any length of time. But the underlying principle for the psalmist is this next verse, right? It's 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. They are sweeter than honey. To my mouth, he had come and learned to delight in the law of the Lord. He would agree with the Apostle John in 1 John 5 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous or burdensome. Rather, they've become his delight. And that ultimately is the work of the Holy Spirit. Finding pleasure in God's word, the psalmist returned to it over and over. And he, that love ultimately led him to read 
meditate, obey. That's the work of the Spirit of God in the new birth. But it's also something that we must learn to cultivate in our lives, to prepare our own hearts and to work it in order that it might yield more fruit. And of course, it's God that brings that increase. So we need to look to His Word. Look to Christ. Keep your eyes fixed on Him. Look to the Word of God as your guide. Look to the Word of God to, uh, to, to strengthen you so that you can refrain your feet from every evil way, that you can keep His Word. Don't depart from His judgments. But listen to the Teacher. Listen to the Holy Spirit who teaches and guides you through His Word.